Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation for the opportunity to speak here. I chose this topic, which is something that um, has been laying around a little bit. Um, so it's not super new, but uh, I, well, we're still on it and picking it up again. And I thought it's just uh, something fitting also looking at the um, mentioning of bifurcations before and maybe interesting for other people in, in Cardiff. Um, and this joint work with Martina Chilos Bruckner uh, and Arjen Dulman, who are in Leiden in the Netherlands. Peter van Heister, oh, I still have Brisbane here, but he's actually in Wageningen in the Netherlands now, and uh, Hideo Ikeda in Toyama, Japan. So the story reveals a, by, first of all, thinking about the Allen Kahn model in 1D, uh, which is maybe familiar to everybody. So it's a phase field model. U is the phase and um, is a phase field in the sense that it's continuously interpolating between a phase called minus one, a phase called one. And one should imagine there being this double well potential and then the probability that particles are somewhere else then minus one and one is relatively low. They just move around in this potential. Um, and uh, well, the equation, first of all, the way that I'm going to look at it is in this form here. So U is the scalar quantity, uh, time derivative on the left, right hand side is the second derivative uh, multiplied with a small parameter epsilon that will become important later. Um, then here's the nonlinearity, it's cubic. So it has one zero at zero, uh, like the potential is asking for, and then one at minus one and plus one, which are the extrema of this potential. I'm gonna consider X on the real line, so no boundary conditions. And this equation uh, has to do with this potential because it can be cast as an L2 gradient flow with respect to this energy functional. Right, so here one has this Dirichlet energy that gives the second derivatives, and then here's the potential energy, which encaptures uh, this double well structure. Uh, I'm not going to use so much this energy structure, but maybe this is something one uh, which is good to have in mind here uh, of the origins of the system. Um, now one can ask a question, okay, what happens if in this infinite domain you have particles on the one side all in the one phase, minus one say, and particles on the other side of this domain in the other one, there's gonna be an interface between them, but both of these uh, values have same energy. So the expectation is that energy wise, it's not really an exchange. And so what happens? And uh, this is one of the themes here, what happens under variations. What happens can be seen here. So this is a snapshot of a simulation uh, where U is this vertical variable. And here you see the plus one, here the minus one. And then there's interfaces forming. Well, that's to be expected because there's a parabolic equation. So things are smoothening. And when one has several jumps back and forth, then one has several interfaces. And now these interfaces in practice are gonna move very slowly, uh, but I'm not really focusing on that. I want to focus more on this question about what about these interfaces is in the sense of a single one. So one thing to note is that in the scaling that I've chosen with the smallness parameter here, the smaller epsilon is, the steeper this front is gonna be. Yeah, because in this energy functional, there was also an epsilon, so that allows large gradients. And the scale of this can be revealed by changing variables to this y, because that's gonna be removing this epsilon here completely from the problem because we're on the real line, so there's no boundary to worry about. But I'm gonna, not gonna do that on purpose, as we'll see later. But first, some more thoughts about that. So. One perspective here is, as was already mentioned, that I have this ODE background as well. So I like to take an ODE perspective. And if you just imagine to have zero time derivative on the left, then this is actually an ODE in space, a so-called spatial ODE. If I write it as an ODE system in terms of this Y variable, I get this second order system written as a first order here. And um, it has again these three equilibrium points now. And uh, if you look at phase space, it's not too hard to see that there's actually a heteroclinic cycle between these two emerging. Yeah, so if you will, this comes from the energy landscape because the spatial ODE is also a Hamiltonian system now. And at the correct energy level, the level set is consisting of these two trajectories or uh, curves which form trajectories. So what it means is that if you are in space on this trajectory, then towards minus infinity in Y, things go to minus infinity, which could be here. So if I would be imagining to sit here, then towards minus infinity, I go here. Of course, if I go to infinity, I'm gonna jump up here, but that's because there's multiple interfaces. 
on this Y scale, I would be zooming in just one of those interfaces. And then the other side, I see the plus one phase, which is when I go here. That's what this arrow is indicating, right? This is the space direction. And likewise, this lower heteroclinic connection here corresponds to this interface. It's towards minus infinity, I go to plus one, and towards plus infinity, it goes to minus one. Okay, so there's this connection uh, on the spatial ODE level to a single of those interfaces, and that's why I'm going to zoom on only on those, actually. Um, some things that are known about these interfaces, if one looks at the existence problem, for example, that's basically settled by what I just talked about. It's a spatial OD with these energy level sets. One can immediately read off the existence of such a single front. Now, that's not a problem. And the typical next question uh, is, well, what about stability in terms of the PDE dynamics? And uh, then one is led to linearize this right-hand side here in U, and that gives rise to this operator LU here. So the first part is just directly the same as before, but the second part, that comes from linearizing this nonlinear term, this cubic nonlinearity, and I substitute in that the front. So it's an X-dependent operator. It's a so-called sturm liouville operator. And it is known from the sturm liouville operator theory that the spectrum is looking like that here. So it is contained in a semi-unbounded interval up to a certain value lambda one, which is strictly negative. And then there's a zero eigenvalue. And uh, this zero eigenvalue can be understood relatively easily because the equation has constant coefficients. So when I have one solution, I can just translate it by any amount and I still get a solution back. So there's a translation symmetry. And this translation symmetry for stability problem always induces zero eigenvalue or zero eigen mode. And uh, because I have a family of, in this case, equilibrium points, I can translate along that family. And if one has a line of equilibria like that, then along this direction, there's always a zero eigenvalue. And more, more can be said about the Allen Kahn equation, much, much more than what I'm talking about here. Uh, let me just mention that uh, this multiple fronts, if they are like in this background here, they will be interacting slowly. This is a so-called metastability that has been understood by Karen Pego in 89 already. Fusco and de Heel have worked on that in the same year. This is actually exponentially slow. They are very slowly moving and there's a coarsening process uh, um, happening, but on an exponentially slow time scale in terms of epsilon. And there's actually a very recent paper by Maria Westickenberg who looks at this from an energy perspective. So not using um, what is also possible here because it's a scalar equation, the uh, comparison principle. But that's, that's not what I'm going to talk about here. So what I'll be talking about is perturbation of that, which can be understood perhaps best by first looking at the so-called Nagumo equation. So if I add this perturbation term here, I'm going to shift the potential energy landscape as here. So this left well is going to be moving up compared to the right. That means that the right, the plus one, now has an, is energe energetically favorable. So one would expect that if there's such a separation between plus one and minus one, this time, uh, this is actually going to be moving towards the plus one because that's energetically favorable. Right? That's what the arrow is indicating. Here's more the energy flux. And um, the um, structure is similar to before. One just has a change in this potential energy as here, and that gives rise to what I've just mentioned. In terms of the spatial ODE, um, I'm not going to show into any details here, but maybe you can believe me that this change induces a structural change in the face portrait, and actually these heteroclinic orbits are going to be broken and no longer exist, at least in, for this spatial ODE that I've chosen. But if I choose a different spatial ODE, namely, I generally go into a co-moving frame, then what I've just talked about is actually going to uh, correspond to a co-moving frame with speed zero. However, if I take this frame speed as a parameter, I already have an epsilon in front of it because I expect that things are going to be moving slow. Uh, so that's my first guess is that it's epsilon speed. That has the impact whenever one does such a change of coordinates, uh, it, for such an equation, it induces this term here. Yeah, it comes first of all from the left-hand side, but the time differentiating, I put it on the right-hand side, so I get this extra term. And this additional degree of freedom, <coughs> the C, 
uh, I can try to exploit in order to find such front connections again. And indeed, if I choose the C correctly, oh, this should have turned to non-zero, sorry. <laughs> so this should be non-zero here. So if I just choose the speed C correctly, and there is in this particular case actually an explicitly known value and an explicitly known heteroclinic connection, the so-called Huxley wave, where this heteroclinic connection that I had before is actually reclosed. Uh, so I can break it in terms of gamma, and then I can close it again in terms of C by choosing correct speed. And one can interpret this as I indicate down here that the energy flux due to this gamma is compensated by the moving interface. And it kind of makes sense that this somehow fits together. Okay, so this is uh, about that. But what I actually want to talk about is not the Allen Kahn equation in this form, but where this gamma parameter that I just introduced is a dynamic variable. And that's what I mean with this large scale field that is part of the title. Uh, so I just invent this for the moment here. This is a V field, again, a smallness parameter in front of it because I'd like to take it as a perturbation. And then I'm asking, and well, maybe you carry on with me. The motivation for this specific form comes from a model that I'll introduce later. But let's just take it as it is. If it is like this, then what I observe is that the second equation V here because there's a one in front of the second order derivative, it lives on a different spatial scale. Yeah? This here lives on the scale that we had before with a sharp interface, but this one has a much wider scale. That's why, why I say large scale field. Um, and this specific form here, as I said, is motivated by this uh, model that I'll introduce. In principle, one could remove the U here, but this is not gonna produce interesting dynamics. The minus V here, however, is helpful because it has a stabilizing effect that one can kind of carry, take along already. And such a separation in scales as here, one diffuses with epsilon, one diffuses with rate one. This is very broadly observed in models, uh, such as spatial scale separation. Uh, in ecology, due to different mobilities in plasma and chemical reactions, it has to do with mobility, usually, of these different species. So much about the modeling here. I'll, I'm not focusing on that. By the way, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, you can also certainly ask later. Okay, so the effect of this second equation for small epsilon is uh, again shown here in a snapshot. So it's a very, very similar picture. I can hardly see any difference in this U variable. At the V variable, is this darker line. And as expected, it lives on a different spatial scale because the gradients are much smaller and it's kind of widely shaped, so to speak. Uh, that's the impact this has. And um, on the other hand, if I'm asking about existence of such an individual front again, I just zoom in here, that's gonna be a little bit harder now because it's a four dimensional ODE problem now. It has these two equations, which are similar to before from the Allen Kahn. I've, by the way, I've rescaled this a little bit, so that's why there's this epsilon in front. I just skip over this. Yeah, it's probably a little hard to follow sometimes when I rescale things. Just believe me, that's hopefully correct, uh, unless there's a typo. And but now there's this coupling to the V component. Yeah, so this is the second order OD we had before, but now there's a coupling to this V component, and the V component satisfies this system of ODE. And this is written in terms of the so-called large scale. Now, as usual, if one looks at this as an ODE in space, then this has two scales and one has this fast and slow scale problem and one can rescale this. So X is here because it's spatial, I call it the large scale. Otherwise it would be say the, the fast one. And then comes the small scale. And uh, that is this interface scale we saw before and the effect it has on the equations is observed. This epsilon is gonna be removed and here's a Y coming up. Toop. Yeah, so I go back once. So what happens is that this removes this epsilon in front of it, but it brings an epsilon on the other side, so to speak. Yeah? So that's very typical. It's very well known. And I think here's already my first typo because that should also be multiplied by epsilon. Yeah. Okay, so it multiplies the epsilons over and then one gets the other scale, which both together have to be compared somehow in order to understand the interface that emerges. And that's a 4D problem. It's a bit more complicated but one can understand it. And I've tried to industry indicate it here that one has these fast jumps, which correspond to these interfaces we had before. And then there's somehow slow dynamics and that corresponds to the slowness here. And both taken together admit the existence of such a front again. And I give a little bit of an idea of a proof uh, how that goes later. 
Um, first, I want to generalize this a little bit more. So instead of introducing it, uh, this V before, I'm going to introduce here a general coupling function G. I think of that as a nonlinear coupling between this large and small scale. And the other change that I'm doing is, first of all, I introduce here a new parameter, but that's not so super important. More important is this time scale parameter that introduced here on the left. So previously it was just set to one, but it's going to be important that one has something like this. I'll explain it in a moment. And the other thing that I've changed is that I now go to co-moving frame with speed epsilon squared. And the reason is that one finds out that this is the appropriate speed with which these interfaces are going to move. It's an a posteriori insight, if you will. There's a well, very, very well-developed theory for fronts in this context by the Japanese school, in particular in the 80s and 90s. And um, they have, from their results, it follows, um, by digging in a bit, that the highest degeneracy that one can get for the existence problem of a front is the so-called cusp point. So a cusp point is this terminology of singularities. I'm going to say a little bit more about that later. Um, but uh, for the moment, I'll just indicate here such a single front looks like that. For some reason, the dark one is now the fast one and the lighter one is the slow one. And uh, one can refer to that theory for the setting as it is here. However, if one introduces a smallness in, term, in this time scale here of that, of that form, so in some sense, this is going to be a large parameter on the left now. If one does that, then this theory no longer applies in the limit epsilon going to zero. And this is one of the themes which is coming up here, that as soon as one plays with scales, uh, right, there's a lot of regimes one can look at and different phenomena happen. So the relevant phenomena that I'm looking at are now happening in this regime. And there's good reasons why one chooses it, but I won't talk about that more now. What I'm doing now is I just multiply this epsilon squared to the other side, whoops, and it is here. And now notice one thing, now these epsilon squares appear in front of both of these terms. So one might think, well, so that means they live on the same spatial scale, but they don't. Uh, and that is the reason for that is that everything else down here is also multiplied by powers of epsilon, let's say. Yeah, so it's a little misleading perhaps, but um, what does it now further do? Well, we can look at this scale again, the Y scale and um, what happens if I change to the y scale is similar to before, right? I swap again the x derivatives now for the y derivatives. They are removed from these terms, both of them, but I, I keep the epsilon, of course, here. Now, if one formally takes epsilon zero here for these terms that I've highlighted, what happens is that I just get the, wave the heat equation in the second component. So this is, would be a limit, in the limit, it would be a, cup, a system of, uh, of some allen kahn equation coupled with a heat equation. And if you think about the spectrum, because it's a diagonal problem now, the spectrum is actually the union of the spectra of the two. And the union uh, the spectrum of the heat equation is the negative half line in the way that I usually think of it. So in the terminology of this, mean, it means that by setting epsilon to zero, I have essential spectrum near the origin. And that's typically bad news for bifurcations. It's more complicated to handle. For positive epsilon, however, this is one can show that it's moving away from the uh, origin and it, there's an epsilon squared gap, but it's small. It's an epsilon squared gap. And the reason why I bring it up is because it has an impact on understanding this discrepancy that for the original scaling I just had, one just has a cusp point, but now we actually have more potentially. And one of the reasons why maybe there's more is, uh, is on this slide here, which is taken or referring to work of Hackberg and Meron in 94. There are also very similar papers by other people. They have looked at this system here, which first of all looks quite different, but actually it's, uh, if you will, just a, in a different scaling regime. Uh, it is more of this Fitzunogumo form. You might know Fitzunogumo equations for uh, nerve conduction, which are related. They also have this Alan Kahn core and then a coupling to a linear equation. But there are differences. I just want to bring it up here because what Hackberg and Moron found uh, is that numerically in space-time, they see this phenomenon here. Right? So this is space, this is time. And now, okay, there are two fronts. One should think of it as two fronts together and they kind of bounce back and forth between each other. Um, I didn't find a better illustration of it. They also have, however, in their paper that a single front is gonna move in strange ways. And that is indicated by this bifurcation diagram here. So epsilon is this parameter on the horizontal axis. The velocity C is on the vertical axis. And what they find is, okay, here one has a stable front, 
But then for smaller epsilon in terms of their scaling, uh, the epsilon is this parameter here. I won't go into details, just let's say it's a parameter and a problem. That's a Hoff bifurcation. So there's a periodic solution emerging here. That's one thing they see. And the other thing they see is that there's a pitchfork bifurcation where there's a branch coming out here and then there's a fold bifurcation and then it stabilizes again. And uh, one has fronts with different speeds. So it's more complicated. It's more complicated than this cusp picture. So what I mean with more than cusp, I hope you'll understand this uh, when I'm a little bit further in my talk, is that such a scenario, pitchfork and a fold, that is something one would not get in the unfolding of a cusp singularity. Uh, this is too much of a degeneracy for a cusp singularity if both of those would come together. So it's a motivation to see, okay, perhaps in this scaling here, one can understand this um, because we might have more liberty now and have more bifurcation options, so to speak. And one can indeed relate this model by Hagberg and Moron to the model that I've just indicated, illustrated here uh, with this choice of this G function. And uh, well, one possible explanation for the fact that there are more things coming up now is that we have a central spectrum close to the origin. So perhaps there are some bifurcation phenomena in terms of eigenvalues and creating more of pot possible bifurcations. However, the answer here is actually negative. Uh, this is a bit embarrassing because we know this for a long time. We've, we never got around to write this up, but it's very similar in proof to what I'll mention later. So the result is the following. The existence criterion for the existence of a front can be written as an algebraic equation. It looks like this. And I'll explain a bit on how, how one finds this. So what this is supposed to say is that if one has zeros of this function in terms of the parameters C, tau, and uh, possible more parameters of G, then this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the existence of a front with the speed C and this chosen tau. Um, and by choosing G, the other thing is that it's interesting perhaps to note that one can produce any one-dimensional singularity. Uh, for example, this cusp. So I already mentioned the cusp before. So here's the unfolding of a cusp. Uh, it goes like that. So one should imagine there's this sheet of um, solutions. It's uh, folded. And this folding creates, if one projects the fold, this picture down here, in the two parameter plane. And this point here, that is the so-called cusp point. And so that's a co-dimension two singularity. And the three dimensional space that I'm plotting here is co actually corresponds to this space. So it's the choice of the first derivative of G and the choice of the second derivative of G at zero viewed as parameters. And then the velocity C as a vertical parameter. And, and this is um, um, at the cusp point, uh, one gets this function here. So I think I should have shifted the, the first derivative actually by, by this value. Oh no, that's that's because of it's taken out here, yeah. So if you look at this form here, uh, they, the, these function G and this term exactly compensate this first derivative. Yeah. Right, so this is one perspective how bifurcations enter into such uh, interface problems. Uh, um, and the way one gets this algebraic equation here, uh, I'll try to illustrate a little bit. That's uh, by Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction procedure. Um, I apologize, it's probably hard to follow it if you see it for the first time, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I just want to give, give you a gist of what's going on. So one has the so-called slow fast decomposition that I've mentioned before. There's the fast interfaces. These are the Allen Kahn fronts. Then on the slow, so-called slow manifolds, one has a slow flow, which is indicated here and here by the dots. So these points become equilibria in the limit. And then one glues these together. One glues the slow flow, which is an equilibrium of the fast system, together with a fast one. Gluing means that this is the ansatz for a solution. That's an I mean, this is a solution which is singular. It doesn't have uh, continuous derivatives, but it's a continuous function. And then one perturbs away from this with the help of an implicit function theorem. And that's this Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction procedure. And the first step to get the existence is to look at this kind of from the side, which is plotted up here, that I intersect this slow manifold at the left end point with the slow manifold at the right end point. And they, I find they intersect transversely and transversal intersections and bifurcation are always good because that means one can employ the implicit function theorem. This uh, intersection is gonna persist under perturbations. 
And now one cranks the handle. So zeroth order, one finds a certain velocity. This is this V sharp. This is where this intersection point is. Then the first order, if one does the uh, expansion, gives this function uh, g evaluated at that point. This is exactly the square root of two over three, which came in the existence condition. And then one employs the implicit function theorem to justify everything, which says that, okay, what we found here to leading order is indeed correct. And all the corrections which come in are of order epsilon. So this is just a very rough sketch uh, to give you an idea on how one proves such things uh, here by an implicit function theorem effectively. Okay, um, I want to come to the next question, namely stability. I mentioned stability already for the Alan Kahn there, then one had the Sturm Liouville operator and the existence problem was trivial. Now the existence problem was a little bit less trivial. One had this Lefanov Schutt procedure, what happens with stability? And it turns out stability is also a little bit more complicated. Um, and one finds uh, the following scenario, which is very similar in other equations of this type. The critical eigenvalues must all be small. So they must be of the form epsilon squared lambda hat. So somehow they come out of zero. And then one finds the so-called Evans function, who's, which is like a determinant and its root, its roots correspond to the location of eigenvalues with multiplicity. And this is at leading order again, so this hat here is the rescaled version of the eigenvalue. And then one kind of cranks the handle and one finds such an equation. It's a bit nasty because it has these square roots in it and the eigenvalue parameters entering into it. So it's not so obvious how many solutions there are, for example. Yeah. One has to look at the branch cut of the square root, et cetera. So it's a little fiddly. But one finds out that there's only one solution in addition to the zero eigenvalue one already has by translation symmetry. Okay, I mean, now that means that all our work was in vain, so to speak, because this hope that we could understand the Hopf-Bifurcation doesn't work. <laughs> so in this scaling regime, it turns out, there is no possibility for Hopf-Bifurcation because there's only one eigenvalue that is really doing something. The zero eigenvalue is just a translation eigenvalue that doesn't contribute. Okay, so that's bad news, but I carried you through it because it kind of gives the theme for what's to follow. Uh, but before that, I want to make comment about the spectral stability here. Um, so the one viewpoint that uh, I tend to have here is that these point eigenvalues I was just talking about, they come from the interface, so to speak. So one finds eigenfunctions which are localized uh, on the interface in these problems. And the tool to locate eigenfunctions that one can use is a so-called Evans function, which works like a determinant. Uh, but it is based on so-called uh, exponential dichotomy subspaces. Um, I won't go into more detail, but uh, that you can read about this, for example, in a nice review by Bjorn Sandstede. So this is a method to find an analytic function whose roots are the eigenvalues, just like the determinant. And now because we have this scale separation in this overall problem, it turns out that the Evans function actually decomposes as a product into two parts, the so-called fast Evans function and the slow Evans function. And these solve simpler subproblems. And in that way, one can have a handle and get actually such an explicit formula as I've just shown. It's by no means obvious how, if I just may jump back, how to get this formula out, right? It's um, a little surprising perhaps. And this type of approach with this decomposition that goes back to work of Alexander Gardner and Jones in 89 and uh, Ayn Dunman, Tasso Karpner and uh, Rob Gardner have worked on this more, many others have. Uh, and I also mentioned again, we, we do it for this particular problem or rather a more general one in that paper. Um, and I also want to acknowledge here the work of Bjorn de Rijk um, in the joint paper where this is very nicely explained how the separation goes. But anyway, so this was a little detour into the technicalities of such point spectrum problems in general. Let me now come to the model that was actually the motivation of all of this, the three component model. This looks like this. Uh, but, and yeah, now, before you carry yeah. on, can I just ask a quick question? So all through that, you carried through the uh, wave speed C. Uh, is it does it always have to be non-zero, or how much? No, of that no, happens? it doesn't. That's a right. good question. So it's uh, sorry, it's the it's hidden in the existence problem here. So in this equation, um, that's where the C enters. Right here, you see how the C enters, and it. Oh, it I mean, it depends on the properties of the function G, whether yeah, it's equal yeah. to zero, you get solutions or not. 
Yeah, I mean, here, of course, you immediately get one solution when G of, as a necessary condition, G of zero has to be zero. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the three component model, which was the original motivation. So first, let me talk about the structure a bit. So you see here now the Alan Kahn core, which is this part. It's exactly the Alan Kahn equation as we had before. Then there's this slow or weak coupling linear again to two other equations now rather than one. So the previous equation comes about when setting gamma equal beta equal zero. That was the simple example at least. And the, both of these equations have the same structure. They work as, in some sense, uh, resetting variables or uh, recovery variables. They have such time scale separation parameters in front of them, and they otherwise have the same structure as before. And this model, not in this particular form with the epsilon here, but with more general parameters, that was derived as a model for gas discharge phenomena by the Purvins group in the 90s. And it has since then uh, gained a lot of attention uh, there was a lot of work done by Peter van Eyster, my collaborator on this one as well, as well as Ayn Duhlmann, Tasso Kappa, Keith Promislow, also Bjorn Sandstede has worked on it. And uh, in the Japanese side, uh, I mentioned Yasumasa Nishura, um, Keiichi Iwida, uh, Teramoto, and Chen, who have also many papers on this uh, model in different parameter regimes, however. One has to be a little bit careful that there's a lot of possibilities for scaling regimes here. And this regime, which is indicated by the epsilons, is particularly convenient for what I'm presenting here. Um, and it is at the same time also a natural regime for the applications. And uh, what I want to set out is to try to explain something like this. Uh, so what you see here is a space-time plot. Um, somehow, ah, should have been the other way around with the slides. <laughs> so first of all, this part. So this is space horizontal time goes up. And what you should see here is an interface that moves to the left. Yeah. So this is one of those fronts. I just saw one component. Uh, but then it seems like, okay, this is happily moving to the left. And I already revealed the issue already. It, it doesn't carry on. It just decides to stop and oscillate. Yeah. Can we explain this? And similarly, can we explain that? So here we have that the front is moving with a non-zero average. So the difference is that here there's a motion on average zero, whereas here it's actually an overall drift. And as you can guess, so this is actually something when for this problem one can actually rigorously prove. And this is how I found the parameters to produce these simulations actually. Uh, it's it's uh, one of those rare instances where one can actually do this all more or less uh, explicitly and rigorously. And I'd like to share this with you here. Okay, so um, I want to again look at the existence of single fronts for this three component system. First, I want to look at stability of such a single front. And then I want to talk about dynamics of these fronts because here we really have more to play with in contrast to what I said before, right? And the previous stuff, basically I was saying in this regime that I'm looking at nothing is happening because there's just one parameter. There's a cusp bifurcation, there's folds. It's not so rich. Okay, so here's the theorem for the existence, and there's a plot of such a solution, computed, by the way, by PD2 path. So there's a sharp interface, this black one, and then the red and blue curves are the other components. Um, and the existence has a similar flavor. There's again an algebraic equation whose solutions are in one-to-one -one correspondence with fronts. However, now I have more parameters and more structure and more structure can be expressed in the sense that I have higher order degeneracies. And it turns out that one can play with the parameters to produce a so-called butterfly catastrophe. So in this singularity theory of scalar functions, this is kind of the next order of, of possibilities beyond the cusp. It's this tom transversality uh, uh, theory and singularity theory, which I refer to here. I'll say a few words about that. Anyway, so it's Coming out, the analysis is basically exactly as I illustrated before. There's an implicit function theorem, and one just cranks the handle, and then out comes this function and this uh, equation. Now I can look for solutions. And so here's my uh, 50 cents on singularity theory. So this is uh, from Poston and Stewart's catastrophe theory book. So butterfly unfolding, that is usually expressed in terms of the potential associated with it, which is this six order polynomial V of X here. And there are these uh, coefficients A, B, C and D. 
And uh, as I said, so this, what we're talking about here in terms of the function V is more the local extrema. Uh, we are interested in the derivatives, so where the zeros are. And the unfolding in these four parameters is encompassed in this diagram. So A is horizontal, B is vertical. And then in each point, one has the option again to change C and D. Uh, I, I won't go through all of it. I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor. For example, here, this is a cusp point here. And then the cusp is changing. And then, whoops, there's kind of three cusps coming together. And that's perhaps the reason to call it butterfly here because of this shape. And if one, one can make a three-dimensional drawing here again, which I stole from Brendan Gaffney, um, which, which looks like this. So there's a, one can again think of a, a surface which is folded and then projects down onto these fold curves. And there one sees the bifurcation structure. So there are three cusp points here, here, and here. Yeah, and so the gist is that this is what one can see in this front bifurcation problem. Um, and maybe I should mention, because I didn't say it really before. So coming from the Alan Kahn perspective, uh, there was the, the, the energy which is shifting when one shifts this coupling function. And that's kind of an external driver for motion. But here, we, I would like to see it as a self-organized energy motion or uh, self-organized energy fluxes that induce this motion of these fronts, uh, which, is, which is of a different kind, right? The previous one is an external forcing, which produces, and here we have it kind of self-organized because it's intrinsic to the unfolding of the bifurcations. All right, so existence, uh, there's a little bit of an understanding hopefully here, and what about stability? And there's also a theorem which has a similar form. Um, here, up here, I plot actually, again, computed with PD Tupper as a spectrum of the front. Uh, and what you should see here, so there are three eigenvalues on the imaginary axis numerically. So it looks like, oh, there's more potential for bifurcations and there's other eigenvalues to the left. And indeed, the theorem says the following. Critical eigenvalues, again, have this form that we had before. They scale with epsilon squared. But now the Evans function is this beast. Yeah, it's uh, a little more fishy. Yeah, there's lambda appearing in the square root term here. That's the eigenvalue parameter. But it also appears here. So we have two branch cuts to deal with. And when we first saw it, we're thinking we actually have absolutely no idea how many solutions this equation has. How many solutions does this have? And really it took, I mean, there was a lot of effort to figure out how to prove it. And it turned, in the end, <clears throat> the proof went by a homotopy argument to a simpler function and then tracking closely how many solutions are created and uh, destroyed through the branch cut. Uh, so it's a bit of complex analysis there. But then it turns out that there are actually at most three solutions. And the critical configurations can be controlled. So three solutions meaning, one is the zero eigenvalue from translation and there are two additional eigenvalues. And two additional eigenvalues have the potential to create a Hopf bifurcation here. Yeah? And that's what you see in this configuration there. That's the idea of that. So we could expect that there's some oscillatory dynamics hidden in there. And uh, that's indeed what happens. And um, in terms of, uh, of singularities, uh, the in most interesting regime where we can do also most analysis is when one creates a triple zero eigenvalue. So I'll be talking about the regime when the three eigenvalues are close to each other. Right. Um, now the question is, what happens with the induced dynamics of that? And here I'm going to be using the center manifold reduction. Um, so for those who haven't really worked with this, this is uh, one can think of it as a realization of the slaving principle that there are some variables which slave others. Uh, and uh, this picture is supposed to illustrate this. So there's a fast dynamics downwards, and then there's a slow dynamics here. So these fast variables here, they're actually slaved to the slow variables along here. That's the idea. So that's where the center manifold somehow is sitting. And it is enough to understand the dynamics by understanding the dynamics on the center manifold. That's the basic idea. And um, it's a locally invariant manifold. It's a manifold that has a dimension of the number of critical eigenvalues. So those on the imaginary axis counted with multiplicity. And the dynamics on this locally invariant manifold uh, is, uh, is actually an ODE of the dimension of that manifold. In order to do such a um, reduction rigorously, one needs uh, certain Fredholm properties or spectral gap properties also. In particular, the essential spectrum should be away from the imaginary axis. Um, 
those this goes back to work by Pliss uh, in '64 and uh, behind the Iron Curtain and Kelly. And uh, I'm I like this book by Mariana Yos, uh, Mariana Ragu and, and Gerard Yos, uh, where you can find the mathematical side of it. Let's say. Right. So let's try to do this here. And indeed, it's possible. I first of all just talk about the double zero eigenvalue, where the third eigenvalue is away. And uh, the result is that near such a double zero configuration, the PDE reduces to, in this case, uh, to reduces to a one dimensional center manifold for the velocities. And it is one dimensional because the equation is translation symmetric, which means that if I look at the positions, then I get the, uh, the derivative of the positions of the velocities are the Z variables. And its derivative depends only on Z and not on the positions themselves. Uh, and that gives rise to, so it's a vibration of the center manifold by the translation symmetry. So even though there are two eigenvalues, it's two dimensional, but then it can be reduced to one dimension. Okay, and <clears throat> the objects on that center manifold, uh, I'm going to call pseudo fronts now because they look very much like fronts. And the dynamics of that is encoded in this Z variable, which we should think about the velocity of the fronts. And the ODE is now the interesting thing. The ODE is topologically equivalent to, exist to this equation here, where the right-hand side is actually the existence condition that we had before. It's exactly the function that appears in the existence condition. Now that makes sense because zeros on the, of that, so if the left-hand side is equal to zero, then I have stationary points of that ODE. Stationary points of the ODE are fronts that move with constant speed. And those are exactly the zeros of this function gamma I had before. And the extra bit is that the information between these, say, consecutive zeros is encoded in this function as well. All right, so that's for the two eigenvalues. So what it means in terms of the cusp, for example, is the following. If I take a point here and now I perturb a little bit from it, then the dynamics is gonna carry me to the stable sheet up here or to the stable sheet down here. Yeah, so I pick one point in parameter space, I fix the uh, setting, and then I have three equilibria. One is unstable here in the middle and these two are stable. And in terms of the dynamics, this can be viewed like this. So the black curve is the velocity, which is slightly negative asymptotically. And then it, the blue one converges to a positive speed. And this in between terms, these are these pseudo fronts. And in terms of the positions, it looks like this. And uh, this is perhaps interesting because it means that there's a front, which first of all moves to the, uh, to the negative values, say, right? So if I looked at it from the side, it moves to the left first, and then eventually it decides to turn around and move to the right. Uh, well, that's what one can get here. So the kind of the self-organized dynamics of this energy exchange is saying that you first move a little bit to the left and then you move to the right. And that's also numerics done with this PD2 path. All right, okay. But what about the triple zero eigenvalue? So I'll spend the past few last few minutes to uh, say a few words about that. Triple zero eigenvalue. As I said, there are three eigenvalues involved. So there was no Hopf bifurcation yet. Everything I've talked about here is basically already appearing in what I was before because it's the unfolding of the cusp. And the triple zero eigenvalue is a little bit more tricky. And one technical thing, I'll just be very quick about it, is that that took us the longest time to realize. Uh, because if one wants to do such center manifold uh, reduction, one needs to be able to do normal forms. And in order to do the normal forms, you need to know the Jordan structure, the Jordan chain structure. And here it turns out that triple zero eigenvalue always gives rise to a triple Jordan block in the linearization. And that is the key results one needs in order to justify all of what, uh, what's done here. But okay, I won't say more about that now. Okay, and then the result is this written abstractly. In terms of the positions, which are called A now here, one gets a third order ODE. Um, or one can write this as a third order ODE where the right-hand side, however, only depends on A dot and A double dot. So this is similar to before that it's actually just a second order ODE. So instead of a three-dimensional center manifold, one just has a two-dimensional center manifold. One can um, uh, compute a lot of things here explicitly. I won't give the formulas, but I'll just mention, first of all, that this equation for the velocities is of this form. Second derivative of the velocities is uh, a right-hand side 
which is a cubic polynomial in C to leading order. And its coefficients can be written abstractly like this, G1, G3 here, and G2, G4 here. So this is a normal form, which is uh, taken in, from Edgar Knobloch's work. I should have quoted this here. And it's one way to write such a normal form. And one can arrange it in such a way that this G1, G2 are zero at a certain value of mu, while G3 and G4 are non-zero. And um, this corresponds to a so-called symmetric Bogdanov Tarkin's point. And um, those who have heard about Bogdanov Tarkin's before, that entails Hopf bifurcations in particular. Okay, so if one looks now, for example, in the book of Carr for the unfolding of the symmetric Bogdanov Tarkin's point, one finds a diagram like that in terms of the parameters G1 and G2. Yeah, at this point, we are at zero. And now we can move around in this bifurcation diagram and look what's going on. So, for example, in region one, in region one, there's one equilibrium which is stable. That's here. In region six, however, there are three equilibrium points and the phase plane roughly looks like that. And that's because if one crosses this vertical axis here, there's a pitchfork bifurcation. One goes from one equilibrium to three. And then when one moves around, something else happens. But let's stick with that for the moment. This diagram, one can actually directly identify in the PDE by numerics. It's this typical pitchfork bifurcation diagram form. Horizontal is the one parameter, vertical is the velocity parameter. And the evolution of solutions can also be identified. If I take, for example, this as an initial point and I just perturb a little bit in that direction, then the dynamics will carry me to this one. That's the expectation from this prediction of the analysis. And indeed, one sees this in the numerics. So this is perturbed and it converges to the value of the velocity, which is this negative value that corresponds to this one here. And for the positions, it means this. So the front is kind of effect it starts very slowly to the right and then it turns around and then moves with that velocity that's one regime another regime is if one if one crosses from one to two then there's a half bifurcation the equilibrium becomes an equilibrium together with this red periodic orbit and that can also be identified numerically and one can play the same game and one finds this yeah, as usual velocities positions are similar and then whoop, one can go further and look at another bifurcation here. Yeah? So there's more in store here from three to four in particular. There's a second Hopf bifurcation. There's a big periodic orbit out here. There are small periodic orbits emerging. Sorry, I'm a little quick now. I just want to give you the gist of it. And then one finds something like that. And here we go. This is exactly what I set out to understand. So this is how one can find and identify it. And now if we perturb this gamma parameter, which I secretly have set to zero all the time, then one can break the overall symmetry and induce an overall energy drift, so to speak. And that gives rise to something like this. I'll just flash this quickly and one finds the solution, the other one that I set out to seek. And that was very interesting for Hideo Ikeda in particular, this Japanese collaborator, because he was always on the hunt to prove such solutions rigorously. And here's one way one can actually do it. All right, that was very quick at the end. I hope you get a little bit of a gist of it. Thank you very much for your interest and attention. And uh, here's my outlook and final slide. Excellent, thanks Jens for a great talk. And yeah, we'll uh, take some questions now if there are any from the audience. I've got one if no one else has anything to jump in with. But, uh, so when you go, you know, six dimensions in your bifurcations, you scare the hell out of me. So we're going to, we're going to simplify. Um, the system I'm interested in uh, bears some resemblance to your initial two component, U and V. Um, but you kind of skipped over the fact that, you know, you're splitting your two PDs, you're, you're throwing away time, yet yeah, this one exactly, and then you have a four-dimensional ODE space. How do you, could you go a bit more into how do you work with that? Or do you have any, is that in the paper? If I go look at those papers, will I get Well, right? yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one, one answer is that, which is perhaps going in the direction that for, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, or I mean, I'm looking at very specific types of solutions. Right? That's, uh, uh, I'm kind of making an ansatz or a, a, Kind of digging uh, in the in the in the zoo of the possible dynamics for very specific things because I yeah. come from Alan Khan, so I expect there are fronts. If there are fronts, I expect there are traveling waves in the ODE. If there are traveling waves in the ODE, then I make this ansatz uh, that first of all I just set this left hand side to zero that yep. would say stationary, right? And then uh, the extended version of that would be okay. I look for moving ones, 
which would give rise to such an ansatz here with the speed involved, right? And if I if if I now set the left hand side to zero, I'm going to skip a lot of dynamics, of course. But that admits me to at least say something, and and this is this uh, existence of these uh, of these fronts, which then comes out. And uh, building, and the idea is to kind of collect some building blocks of dynamics, right? So I collect existence of fronts, and then I realize, okay, these fronts turn around, so they coexist somewhere. And when they coexist, I can ask, okay, what's the interaction between them? And that is this pseudo dynamics fronts, if you uh, this this dynamics of pseudo fronts, if you will. That um, so that's that's maybe one viewpoint that I try to build up possible insights into the dynamics. But this is by no means complete. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, this system here, to our knowledge, doesn't have a Lyapunov structure, for example, or so. And in fact, maybe I should emphasize that for this three-component system, the, the fact that we get a Hopf bifurcation means that there is no Lyapunov function here, right? So it is not uh, just a gradient flow. Yeah. That's a, that's a structural important difference to the Allen Kahn. Allen Kahn is a gradient flow. That periodic dynamics is precluded, at least for finite energy, or uh, unless except for these, you know, there's periodic coarsening. Um, but other than that, <clears throat> it has to be monotone, and this is precluded here. Uh, so this is uh, ruled out. I mean, there's no possibility of such an energy functional here. Fair enough. Okay. Oh, very interesting, though. So, uh, You've given me a lot of food for thought by looking at it in this way. I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't thought about that. Have we got anyone else with questions? Yeah, may maybe, maybe I have one. So it's like, um, so really nice, nice talk. Uh, maybe just one comment. I don't know if you. Uh, no, the uh, there's a there's a really nice program uh, called DEFCON that that's uh, made at Oxford from Patrick Farrell. I don't know if you know it. No, I don't. No, it's uh, uh, it's also continuation software. Yes, yes, and it uses Phoenix uh, to solve the PDEs underneath, mm -hmm. and then uses a, a deflation method to remove the solutions if it finds one. Yeah, I know about that. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's like easy to use or something. Just, just, just yeah, that, that's comment. interesting, indeed. I mean, this is this is a very nice idea. I mean, one of the problems with doing numerical continuation is that one is relying on the convergence of a Newton method, and in order for that to work, one has to be in kind of the basin of attraction of the zero solution. And if there are multiple possibilities, right, it's sometimes one is stuck yeah. in the basin of one and one doesn't see the other. <laughs> and yeah, this deflation yeah, yeah. is a very nice idea to remove known solutions yeah. and get further mm -hmm. branches. And, yeah. and I think in the, so if you just search for DEF CON, you, you'll find it. And I think they have an example for the Allen CAN as well. I don't ah, know. I, yeah. I haven't seen any, any, any plots of that is just the Allen can yeah. on the uh, okay. On, I think I mean I have, I've looked at it for a while a while ago and indeed I mean for Allen Khan, um, there's more than what I've just shown. If you look at it on a fixed domain, for example, uh, uh, one has coexistence of many solutions. There are fronts. There yeah, are, yeah. I mean all kinds of periodic kink anti kink sequences that fit into the domain and they coexist. And that's what yeah, I exactly that, that link. Yeah, that there's the selection uh, with this numerical tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. And just add a DEF CON link to the uh, to the chat. Ah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Katerina, I think has a question. Uh, hi, this is a great talk. Uh, and I, I have a question, yes. It's about the excitable systems because you talked about the Fichun Agumo system. And um, we have been working with calcium signal systems, which are similar to those, albeit with uh, more complicated reaction kinetics. Um, so, um, and thinking about bifurcations, that actually Thomas is part of the people working on this. And we have been thinking, in fact, yesterday about these nonlinear waves doing stuff and. Um, so I'm just looking at the bifurcation diagram and thinking how we would apply it. Maybe Thomas already has an idea, but uh, since we are here, mm. 
Yeah, I mean, the first step of what I understood is that also explorative, right? That you just that you compute bifurcation diagrams uh, to get an idea of what's going on, so to speak. And here we have the luxury for this particular system. I mean, not even for this one that I'm just showing here, right? For the, the, this equation up here in this form, it's not clear to me exactly what's going on. Um, it's in some sense already too complicated, so to speak, right? Uh, it's and it's a different regime, uh, if one is honest. Uh, so I should once more say as a kind of um, a disclaimer that what I've presented here is possible because of the luck we have with the scaling regime, so to speak, that in this scaling regime, it is possible to do these things. And oftentimes this is just not in store because it's uh, uh, just analytically not accessible. But here it is. That's the advantage. And that's why it's kind of a, a paradigm example, perhaps, where those methods can really fly. Uh, so I'm afraid if you have something like this with more complicated nonlinearities, mm. uh, what I've presented here is, is uh, cannot be directly copied, but maybe it's an inspiration and it gives directions for, say, explorative uh, mm. study. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to add to that, uh, from I, I am working on the problem with Katarina is I would definitely want to throw PD to because as as Yen said, it's often you go into this knowing what you're looking for. So I'd want to throw PD path at it to see what kind of bifurcations are there. So that will hopefully give us a handle on whether we can do anything. Yep. And and if, for example, uh, you you believe there's more than you see with PD two path, then uh, it makes sense to uh, use what was just mentioned before this this deflated continuation. Uh, because it it allows you to explore this kind of Newton iteration space uh, in a in a better way, but it's also more costly. <laughs> I also have to learn Python. Mm, okay, <laughs> PD to path is in MATLAB. That's why I like it. There's, there, there's okay. a reason why. I like it. <laughs> Excellent. So I don't think we've got. Anyone else waiting, have we? So, uh, yeah, well, uh, thanks a lot for the great talk, Jens, and uh, yeah, excellent to have you um, give us this uh, talk in Cardiff remotely. But yeah, it'd be brilliant to make the most of this strategic partnership, and maybe we can see you in person sometime. I do, I do fully recommend going to Bremen. It's a lovely, lovely city. It's, <laughs> Thank you know, you. it's Thank one you. of these wonderful European cities where you just feel so safe. It's picturesque. The place they have you would stay, you're on right on the river. <laughs> the only thing is, on a Sunday morning, all the church bells go off. You, you want to lie in on a Sunday morning, they don't.